Welcome back to this week's episode of the Money with Katie show, my rich family. There is a specific strain of online discourse that loves to study the rich. And I spend a lot of time on FinTwit, thanks to my profession, or at least that's what I'm telling myself. And I routinely witness this obsession with figuring out how rich people got that way. Often it involves a certain projection of wealthy people cosplaying poverty or engaging in other quirky behavior that we kind of zero in on and assume it must be some trade secret of the billionaire class. Like we love to examine and highlight the ultra frugal or otherwise extreme habits of wealthy people and then imply a causal relationship where it's not clear that one actually exists. This is a distinct shift from the way people used to obsess over celebrities and starlets for their glamorous lives and paternity scandals. No, now we're interested in, and let's be honest, a little bit in awe of, anyone with money, not just celebrities, which seems to be a clear line of demarcation between 21st century America and centuries past. The implicit suggestion is that Mimicking the behavior of ultra wealthy people will net the same outcome for the mimicker. You probably know the kind of content that I'm talking about. That's why today we're taking a look at some of the world's wealthiest and most famous one percenters morning routines. Yes, we're talking about headlines like here's how nine billionaires start their mornings, which is a real business insider headline and eight ways rich people view the world differently from the average person, which is a real CNBC headline. This stuff is everywhere in business and financial media, but has it always been been this way. Okay, so let's back up a few decades because in the age of the robber barons, so think Carnegie, Rockefeller, Vanderbilt, JP Morgan, you know, the billionaire boys, we didn't study their morning routines. We didn't admire them. We didn't defend them when our friends went on the 19th century equivalent of a Twitter rant talking shit about Rockefeller's exploitative labor practices while sloshing bathtub gin at the local pub. Because back then, the collective 99% kind of understood that the haves, or colloquially referred to as the 1%, were expressly not the champions of the have-nots. No, it was quite the contrary. There was a cultural understanding that the extreme haves often had at the direct expense of the have-nots. History and culture writer Nicholas Gilmore wrote for the Saturday Evening Post, quote, British economist John Stuart Mill referred to this kind of wealth in the mid-19th century as the unearned increment. Divine right was un-American, but passive income was filling the wallets of a select few in the country while farmers and workers struggled. Men like Cornelius Vanderbilt, J.P. Morgan, and John D. Rockefeller acquired hundreds of millions of dollars in the 19th century by building monopolistic empires and strong-arming competition and their own workers into submission, end quote. But somewhere along the way, over the last mm, 50 years or so, that kind of shifted. Instead, we decided we might get further ahead if we just learned a little bit more about how the rich among us got all that money. And on its face, seems like a logical conclusion, right? Shouldn't imitating the habits of already wealthy people net the same results? Perhaps all of this worship and admiration stems from the fundamental belief in a mostly meritocratic world that most rich people did it themselves and that replicating their behavior will produce a similar result. They must know some secret, right? But let's dig into where this belief comes from because there's usually one statistic that gets thrown around a lot when we talk about meritocracy, that most millionaires are self-made. Self-made. We love a self-made personal narrative. More specifically, that 88% of all millionaires are self-made. Now, the claim seems to originate in a U.S. news article that cites a 2017 Fidelity Investment study referenced all over the web. But oddly enough... No such study is ever linked in any of these articles. When I tried to find the original study in question so I could look into the basis and methodology used to substantiate the claim, it did not seem to exist. I enlisted the help of my pro fact check editor, Kate, to track it down. She was able to locate a PDF of a Fidelity slide deck that was buried somewhere in an old press release from 2021 that claims on slide 34 that 81% of millionaires they surveyed self-reported that their wealth was entirely earned alone. Only 19% checked the box for inherited 
or increased by others. So we dug into the appendix where the methodology was outlined. They surveyed 1,429, quote, affluent investors with assets ranging from 50K to 10 million. And the results were that 81% of the millionaires in the sample claimed that they were entirely self-made. This statistic is referenced all over the place, but the issue with you know, a small sample size of self-report data on this particular question or topic specifically is probably obvious. Another popular source for the claim comes from none other than Ramsey Solutions. In a nine-page PDF, they detailed the results of a survey they conducted with over 10,000 U.S. millionaires who were asked again, hey, are you self-made or did you grow up middle income? Among other things, 80% of the millionaires, again, reported that they grew up below middle income and had no inheritance. There's too much editorializing in the survey results for me to take it seriously as a reputable source of purely objective data, setting aside the very obvious incentive for a company who sells financial advice to market this dream. Quote, so how did all of these people hit the million dollar mark? Most of them did it through consistent investing, avoiding debt like the plague, and smart spending. All right, no qualms with that so far, but listen to the end of the quote. No lottery tickets, no inheritances, no six-figure incomes. Really? End quote. Okay, Houston, the math is not mathing. No leverage, no six-figure income, and no inheritance? Are all of the survey respondents 70 years old? Because without any of those tailwinds, especially with the cost of living today, I'm not sure how this is mathematically possible outside of a 50-year investing timeline. But let's suspend statistical disbelief, even if we were to take it at face value and believe that only 12% of millionaires inherited any wealth. The claim itself needs to be unpacked a little bit. Are we talking about people who literally inherited millions? The U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics suggests 30% of American households inherited something between 1989 and 2007. And as we know about compounding, inheriting even a modest five or six figure sum early enough in life all but guarantees eventual millionaire status if it's invested in real estate or an index fund and left alone for 40 years. There's a saying in investing that your first 100,000 is the hardest. Going from zero to six figures with no momentum is truly a slog. So receiving an inheritance of any size would supercharge this effort. But even generous inheritance isn't necessarily the only thing worth examining here. For example, I've never inherited anything, but that would be a gross oversimplification of the financial benefits that began accruing to me at a very young age in the form of financial investment from my parents. So it begs the question, what's really the difference? I didn't have student loan debt, my parents gave me my first car, and they funded my lifestyle until I graduated from college, including private school through 12th grade. Not to mention the generosity of a friend's family who allowed me to live with them and raid their pantry for free for the first several months when I began working so I could save money. Sure, I worked hard at flapping my wings, not disputing that at all, but there was still a fair amount of wind beneath them, courtesy of other people in my family and community. And there's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't seem fair, though, to claim self-made status when someone else bankrolled the first 20 years of your existence, does it? So it begs the question, what's a fair amount of permissible help, and when does your success become contingent upon it? Is it even possible to accurately apportion certain parts of your success to luck and other parts to work, or does it all kind of compound together in an inextricable, soupy mess? It also introduces a slippery slope of, well, then what does count? And that's precisely my point. The millions of decisions and lucky breaks and opportunities that accumulate to form an individual life are far too varied and random to produce some reliably replicable path to great riches. For example, Bill Gates went to the Lakeside School in Seattle, which was one of the only high schools in the world that had computers. It's estimated that only 300 high school students worldwide had access to computers at the time Gates was in high school. That is a literal one in a million start. And he admits as much. He says, quote, if there had been no Lakeside, there would have been no Microsoft. He told that to the school's graduating class in 05. There's no alternate reality wherein Bill Gates went to a public school in Cincinnati and didn't get exposed to computers until he was in his 20s. We just simply cannot know what would have happened otherwise. So 
Does that mean one shouldn't try? Absolutely not. Luck is where opportunity meets preparation, right? It just means that attributing substantial outcomes to any one individual variable is not possible. Enormous outcomes are the culmination of a lot of factors coalescing in a very specific way, but we tend to only focus on one effort. And I understand the temptation to believe in the purely self-made man myth because a perfect meritocracy feels a lot more motivating. It's the only factor that we have direct control over. But when I look at many, not all, but many of the prominent people in the world right now, they seem to have something in common. It's Wait for it, the Nepo baby discourse. I'm sure you knew this is where we were headed. So this is sweeping social media trends as it seems that our collective consciousness suddenly woke up to an interesting revelation kind of about the same time about the similarities between most of the famous wealthy people among us. Seemingly overnight, the Nepo baby discourse spiked, but I wasn't sure if my own perception was skewed. So I asked Shannon McNamara, the host of Fluently Forward, a pop culture and entertainment podcast, what she she thought about the seemingly sudden microscope on nepotism fame, and she had an interesting take on why nepotism as a concept has reached fever pitch at this particular cultural moment. I think one part of the reason for this that not a lot of people are talking about is it's kind of a sexy word. Like nepotism sounds cool. Nepo baby has a ring to it, and certain words get picked up in trending vernacular, you know, like gaslighting, narcissist, um, PR, nepo baby. And I think sometimes certain words kind of have this like highbrow sound to them that make people want to use it more. And then I think the other reason is just timing. I think this has kind of been gearing up for a while. I think all the way back with the Olivia Jade getting into college with your fake rowing scholarship scandal, right? She's technically a Nepo baby. We, Her mother, Lori Laughlin, we looked at that. Okay, that's interesting. Euphoria came out with Maude Apatow. Okay, who's this actress? I don't recognize in Euphoria. Oh, okay, it's the daughter of Judd Apatow and Leslie Mann. So I think it's kind of been brewing for a while and we almost kind of reached this perfect point where both um, the celebrities who are becoming famous today are also in line with the way that social media is ramping up because nepotism has been around since forever, but Google and TikTok haven't. And we're finally at the first point in history where nepotism coincides with like things going viral overnight. Haley Baldwin Bieber, daughter of Stephen Baldwin and wife to Justin Bieber, for example, is on the cover of the Forbes 30 Under 30 issue this past year for being, and I quote, a mogul, thanks to her new skincare line. And 5'3 Lily Rose Depp, yeah, you know that last name, is a runway model, a world in which the niece of an immensely wealthy actor and the wife of an even more enormously wealthy pop idol is heralded as a business mogul is simply not a perfect meritocracy. Kylie Jenner received a lot of flack when she was named Forbes's youngest female self-made billionaire, and people rightfully balked at the self-made qualification as she was born into the most famous family since the Jackson 5. Not that the Forbes 30 under 30 list should be a preeminent source of who's successful. Uh, Sam Bankman Freed, Elizabeth Holmes, and Caroline Ellison all made the list in recent years, so that was pre-criminal convictions, but I rest my case. And perhaps nobody embodies the questionably self-made more than the other young Kardashian Jenner sister, Kendall Jenner, the highest paid model in the world, who has said in interviews that her success as a runway model is due to her own hard work and not the genetic and reality TV lottery that she won. She's on record saying she thinks her family's fame has actually made things tougher for her. She reassures her viewers that she did, in fact, have to fly all over Europe for auditions, but omits that it was in a private plane that her family owned and for auditions she would not have gotten without Kris Jenner's supernatural pull. Of course, I had a platform and I'll, I never took that for granted. I always knew that that was there, but that almost made my job a little bit harder. Here's Shannon breaking down these dynamics a little bit further. Kendall Jenner is a very interesting case, too, because she doesn't say that her family got her modeling jobs. Every time she's asked about this, she says that it's because of her platform on the show. And the show is called Keeping Up with the Kardashians. Like, she's so removed from nepotism that she doesn't even think she got on the show because of her family. She's like, well, I happened to get on the show, and then the show happened to get me a modeling gig, which obviously is just nepotism across the board. And what's really interesting is that when she comments on nepotism or being handed certain advantages, she always talks about 
the offensiveness of the comments. And, you know, Maude Apatow has said before that she's sad to be called a nepotism baby. And I think a lot of us find that really confusing because people and celebrities out there think that a mention of their privilege is offensive. And it's not. So I think already from the beginning, we're just looking at these situations from completely different pages. And to be very clear, I don't think either of us are mad at people who have transmuted their familial name and social status into meaningful careers. Honestly, good for them. We're all working with the resources we have available to us, right? And they're all different. It would be easy to rest on your laurels and skim off the top of your trust every month and not do much of anything. I'm sure they are working hard, relatively speaking. I'm merely trying to make the point that I don't think we'll ever live in a world where your last name or who you know or how much money your family has or what connections you have don't matter. And I don't even think that would be a realistic goal. What I am proposing is that we confront this reality head on and we accept it for what it is. That people born into wealth or status are born on third base. Whether it's wealth that ensures you don't have to pay for your own college, like me, or the wealth and notoriety that accompanies being Johnny Depp's daughter. And if we do that, that means we don't need to seek out Kendall Jenner's modeling advice. Hi, Seventeen. It's Kendall Jenner. Um, I'm kind of here to talk to you guys about modeling and talk and give you guys some tips on it because I know there are a lot of girls out there that are around my age and want to become teen models. And first off, I just want to start off saying it is so fun. I love it. Um, I'm having a great time. It is hard work sometimes, but I love doing it. Because we'd acknowledge that you could do literally everything she does and still not generate the same outcomes because you're missing the key ingredient. Your mom isn't one of the savviest and most well-connected business sharks of the 21st century. Jenner's approach to modeling and her success as a model may not be entirely uncorrelated, but they're certainly not correlated in any meaningful way that's deserving of replication. We'll be right back after a message from the sponsors of today's episode. We've been talking a lot about taxes lately lowering your tax bill, how to handle your side hustle, what to do about those tax advantaged accounts, you name it. But this is a judgment-free zone if you still haven't gotten around to actually filing and time is still on your side. And fortunately, Tax Act makes it really, like, really easy to do the damn thing. Their user-friendly platform offers guidance every step of the way and you rest easy knowing their calculations are correct. They even have a $100,000 accuracy guarantee to cover any errors. Don't deal with filing an extension. File your taxes quickly and confidently with Tax Act. Get started with Tax Act for free at taxact.com slash moneywithkatie. That's T-A-X-A-C-T dot com slash moneywithkatie. Of course, our fascination as a society is not limited to the car Jenners. It used to be that people became rich because they were celebrities. Now, people become celebrities because they are rich. This is no more apparent than with the entrepreneur liberty class. This brand of trustworthy, ultra rich person is especially dangerous because these are individuals who do have an extraordinary amount of influence over decisions that impact millions of people. Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, these four horsemen of the tech apocalypse are permanent fixtures in our news cycles. The pedestalization of the entrepreneur liberty has reached fever pitch as well. Here's Shannon again. There's almost like three different groups of people that we worship. It's like people with a lot of money, people with a lot of talent, people with a lot of beauty, people with a lot of followers in the past couple of years, right? Um, some of those have stood out more than the others. I think worshiping business moguls is definitely new, and I think it's because they just feel more accessible now. So when I listen to the All In podcast, that's the only time once a week where I'm able to listen to a conversation that has four billionaires talking about something. Well, Elon Musk is tweeting out memes and replying to people on Twitter, and I think it makes a lot of people think, okay, if I have the same breakfast habits and the same meme preferences as them could i also have the same bank account and the same lifestyle it just like seems more within reach and i think sometimes it is warranted like 
I really admire Tim Ferriss because he's one of those people that kind of got famous by being rich, but he also puts out content. He makes books. He does podcasts. He has blog posts. He it gives you helpful advice. He's doing video content. So he is kind of like a celebrity. But then there's rich people like Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates and anyone who worships them. I'm like, that is kind of weird because like they're a business. They're not a person. Speaking of Elon, it's probably fair to say that he's entrenched in his emperor has no clothes era. But despite that, people People still vehemently defend him on Twitter, the same social media app that he recently purchased for $44 billion, a phenomenon that has generated bountiful memes like the Simpsons screen grab of a man labeled weird nerds diving in front of a gun labeled valid criticism to save Elon. And my favorite defense is, is very telling. It's, you know, if you don't like how he's running his companies, why don't you go make $44 billion and do it yourself? Man, you're, I wish I would have thought of that, right? The stand culture for this billionaire especially is pretty bewildering. The fact that Elon Musk has fanboys, but you don't really see fanboys for Jeff Bezos, you know, I find that interesting in terms of like which entrepreneurs and billionaires have devoted fans versus people who are like oh, I just don't really connect with them so I think it's interesting that like even businessmen want and cultivate those parasocial relationships and I think that's really fascinating but Stan retorts that suggest his actions are inherently justifiable because he's the one who has 44 billion dollars to spend in the first place betrays some straw man logic and underpins the broad problem. This presumption that having a metric dick ton of money absolves you of all personal responsibility must render all of us perpetually accepting of whatever you choose to do with it because you must have done something spectacular in order to come into possession of it is built on the foundation of this same meritocratic self-made logic that if you become very wealthy, it must be because you are inherently smarter, better, more deserving, more scrupulous, therefore insulating you from any criticism or questioning. This is troublesome because, well, I'll let a video from the production house Second Thought take it from here. If they can successfully convince you that one, they have earned their wealth, and two, that you can do it too, they can use those two assumptions to convince you of some far more nefarious things. For starters, they can convince you to act against your own self-interest and the interest of the vast majority of Americans. The most obvious example of this is making it seem like it would be better for everyone if billionaires paid less in taxes, if we just got the government out of the way of these people who have proven to us that they are visionaries, that they alone know how to manage money. And sure, there are a lot of people that came from wealthy families that did not go on to achieve massive success, but the amount of financial alchemy that has to occur for one to become a billionaire in a single human lifetime often has to begin with a rather lush start. Elon Musk is on the record in a mysteriously since-deleted Forbes article from 2014 that's now only accessible via the Wayback Machine, which is a site that archives web pages, stating the following, quote, I've been in physical danger before. The funny thing is, I've not actually been that nervous. In South Africa, my father had a private plane. We'd fly in incredibly dangerous weather and barely make it back. This is going to sound slightly crazy, but my father also had a share in an emerald mine in Zambia. End quote. Again, the article has since been taken down. Now, I'm not necessarily suggesting that his family's money is the reason he became successful. I think that would be empirically difficult to prove. I'm just simply noting again, there's no alternate reality where we can see Elon grow up in a different context to determine if he would still achieve the same things. Much like Bill Gates being one of 300 kids worldwide with access to computers, we just don't know the exact extent to which one's fortune early in life impacts their success later. What we do know is that that the internet happens to be a double-edged sword. And with great power comes great exposure to people who have nothing better to do than comb through your public court records from lawsuits, which reveal that the degree you claim to hold from pen in computational physics does not actually exist. There's a great quote by Bill Murray where he's like, if you want to be rich and famous, try being rich first and then see if you want the famous as well. And it's basically just saying that like it's so much better to be rich than it is to be famous. But for some of these billionaires, right, just being rich seems to not be enough. The point is we have to be careful about equating wealth with boundless competence and capability and honestly, 
vice versa. And that's partially why the self-made millionaire myth is a bit of a slippery slope because it likens wealth to deservingness and it strips success of context. It suggests that everyone begins playing the game of life with the same hand of cards and those who win have demonstrated an ability to consistently outplay everyone else. Even though we mostly know this isn't actually the case, our collective hive mind tends to default to that heuristic that wealth and success equals goodness, which can explain, well, a lot of what's happened in the last couple decades. The other reason the self-made myth has questionable consequences is because it implies that outcomes are perfect representations of capability and willingness to work hard, thereby creating a powerful self-loathing cocktail when things don't go according to plan. And that tends to reinforce the way things are already trending. If more power, money, and opportunity flow to those who already have power, money, and opportunity, the advantages compound, and more importantly, the momentum of disadvantages becomes more difficult to stop, too, because there's an assumption that if you're not traditionally successful, it's because you must not deserve to be. At the end of the day, the myth has dicey implications and is ultimately empirically unfounded. There is no empirically rigorous way to validate how many millionaires are truly, quote, self-made without further defining what's meant by self-made. So at the very least, the claim deserves some skepticism overall. Regardless, the data around who is a millionaire in the U.S. is telling. It's comically difficult to get a straight answer. Most sources just refer to one another without any one source clearly citing the original data set, likely because there is no official source. Unlike data around income that can be obtained from official tax documents, you don't have to report your net worth to the IRS. Small sample size self-report survey data often metastasize around the web. That said, depending on the source, it appears approximately 90% of global millionaires are male, which to me is one of the clearest indications that self-made is a myth, if only because half of the world population is female. It stands to reason that if only the hardest hustling people became millionaires, your global millionaire count would be a lot closer to representative of half and half. The most important takeaway is to be particularly conscious of whether we are internalizing these narratives around what it takes to be successful. Bring a healthy level of cynicism to the metaphoric billionaire morning routine and be careful not to impute too much significance to what time you wake up in the morning, whether you're working 100 hour weeks as Elon likes to recommend or any other habits that are purportedly the key to becoming a self-made millionaire. Because upon further inspection, much of this advice is at best too generic to actually be helpful or at worst patently counterproductive no but yeah i'm just i like playing my favorite music it just makes me happy and gets me into a good mood um oh and sometimes people have like their better side um just like i guess feel comfortable with all your sides <laughs> um but i mean if you feel good with one side go with that one side, I guess. I don't know. The fact that the highest paid celebrity model in the world's advice is to just look good from every angle feels like the modeling equivalent of the financial advice to just stop being poor. The truth about headlines like the eight ways rich people see the world differently than poor people is that they suffer from the classic chicken or egg mix up. They attribute generating wealth to certain characteristics when in fact, these are merely attributes of someone who is already rich. Number two on one of these lists, rich people believe starting a business is the fastest way to make money while the average person believes starting a business is risky. Well, who is able to more easily take on risk? Someone who is already wealthy or otherwise has a safety net or someone who is feeding a family on a paycheck to paycheck income. Being able to take risks without seriously jeopardizing other aspects of your life is a privilege that is not afforded to many. And the survivorship bias inherent to these success stories kind of obscures the reality of how disastrous outcomes can be when a business isn't successful. And we can't forget number six on the list that rich people believe money is earned through thinking while the average person believes money is earned through time and labor. Well, yeah, you can't quit your job and sit on the couch and think your way to your rent payment. What would happen if doctors and construction workers and farmers and truck drivers heeded this advice and decided sitting around and thinking would be a more lucrative use of their time? It's 
absolutely wonderful to believe that anything is possible if you work hard. Some degree of naivete is useful in business and in life, but we would be wise to interrogate these socioeconomic, sociocultural tropes around wealth, deservingness, and the idea of being self-made. If nothing else, the word itself, self-made, betrays its most fundamental flaw. It focuses on the self. It ignores the scores of people, communities, and systems that are required for anything of consequence to be built. Recognizing the variety of inputs that are important, like our relationships, luck, timing, hard work, perseverance, can help us focus on the true needle movers of financial progress, not just the stereotypical work longer hours and wake up earlier billionaire mindset advice. All right, y'all, that is all for this week. Before we go, comment below what you thought the most interesting part of this discussion was, and remember to like and subscribe to our channel. I will see you next week, same time, same place, on The Money with Katie Show. Our show is a production of Morning Brew and is produced by Hannah Velez and me, Katie Gaddy Tossan. Devin Emery is our chief content officer, and our video editors are Christy Muldoon, Sebastian Vega, and Nicole Friedman. Additional fact-checking comes from Kate Brandt.